So uh, good morning uh, from India. I think Mr. Sarat Das and Official Khan and all the delegates at the fifth uh, global conference on business technology, GCBT in 2022. First of all, uh, Shahid, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to participate uh, this uh, in this event. And of course, on the topic uh, skill development, our goals on the survival curve. I think you've had a very interesting set of speakers uh, yesterday and from all accounts, a very excellent uh, day. I think as opening batsman uh, today, I hope I can keep up the tempo and uh, hopefully uh, provide some context to the panel discussion uh, that follows, which is on scaling youth for global employability. What I'm going to do uh, today is really uh, talk about certain trends. Uh, Taking for granted uh, that all of us, you know, being in the education and allied uh, space know that uh, the time between the four industrial revolutions was greatly reduced. And I won't go through the time span of the industrial revolutions. Uh, but then I will share a view on the uh, categories of population that we need to look at, you know, from a survival, uh, you know, uh, curve basis. Uh, talk about the various types of skilling. And then how as a global community, we need to address the possible roles and the possible roles of different players. And of course, uh, take any questions if they are there. Uh, first, you know, in, in case of the survival uh, curve, uh, I would like to really uh, quote, uh, you know, an historian, an English historian, but who's now longer teaching in England, but teaching in, in, in the US, uh, um, Adam Tuze. Uh, he talks about, he defined a uh, term called poly crisis, which is economic uncertain, uncertainty and equality, as well as political instability, threat of climate change. And the way he talked about the poly, uh, poly crisis was that all these need to be understood through the interactions with each other. So the survival going forward is how we understand the interactions of these different elements and the impact on the skilling uh, ecosystem. Of course, you know, while Robert Rubin was reviewing his latest uh, book, which is on uh, shutdown, which is Tuz's latest book on the COVID crisis, he starts it challenges uh, us to consider the ways in which our institutions and systems and the assumptions and positions and divisions that under uh, undergrid them and leave us ill-prepared for the next crisis. I think the whole education and skilling ecosystem uh, is in that current flux as we uh, talk. I think if you look at some of the challenges that we face and what is the you know, survival crisis, if I were to look at it, for example, the World Economic Forum talks about 65% of the primary school students globally will end up working in jobs that do not exist today. It's come in the various uh, WEF uh, editions of uh, future of jobs. Of course, the gig economy will expand and therefore temporary employment uh, as a share of all employment globally, which according to the uh, ILO increased in the last decade by over 6%. Uh, and about 30% uh, of uh, employment will be temporary employment. Of course, then 67% of the jobs are susceptible to automation in the developing world. Of course, then 67% of the jobs are susceptible to automation in the developing world. then 67 I think there's a feedback coming in. Okay. Right. So uh, then half of the worldwide workers need upskilling or reskilling in the next three years. And that's a big, big number that you look at. And given that 40% of the curriculum targeted to students of class 8 to 12 is now obsolete. So, you know, you look at 65% of primary schools who, who will end up working in new jobs today. The balance, 35% uh, are actually looking at 40% curriculum, which is obsolete. And rapid expansion of the knowledge and practice um, and professions are increasing pressure on the curriculum, time, and require a calibrated approach and refocus uh, on outcomes. So, you know, what is not changing is very interesting. Not changing is the number of 
hours that we have to teach, the number of this, the, the length of a class, you know, 24 hours in a day is all that we got to do. So we can take eight hours to 16 hours to 24 hours. But, you know, when you go to sleep the next morning, the knowledge is actually doubled. And, in you know, with the time being constrained, the rate of obsolescence of technology is also increasing. So if you look at in the 90s and 20s, the web services actually became obsolete in three to five years time. Uh, in, the 20, in the 10s to 15s, it was about 14 to 18 months. Today, it's actually happening overnight, literally. Uh, and of course, if you look at uh, Lewis Girish on the velocity of obsolescence, writing back in 2013, he said that the velocity of obsolescence has been increasing and accelerating dramatically in early stage ventures of web-enabled services and more importantly and more recently in mobile-first products dictating the shortening of cycles in innovation. Since this is a conference on business and technology and then related to skills, I thought this would be relevant uh, to your audience. The other thing is the students also have a view. So a student writing on a web post actually talked about what is generally disappointing as well as disturbing is that curriculum and content taught at the undergraduate level, a large portion of what is being taught are technologies developed over 40 years ago. While it, a bit of history is no doubt more important regarding the development of the technology and relevance, but sadly, it should not cover two thirds of the syllabus. A lot of you in the listening in or part of saying a conference of the education world. So it is relevant to all of us today. And then he goes on to say, our systems at most places are hell bent, and I'm quoting him, on testing rather than teaching. So there are a number of actually activities that have been done, right? And a number of skill gap studies that have been, that have been uh, conducted. And I would like to just say that, you know, there's a very interesting uh, work which is coming out of World Skills and the Future uh, Institute. Unfortunately, in the current context, the Future Institute is based in Russia, but you know, Russia, Ukraine war, I think even despite that, the work that they did was pretty seminal. And a lot of the World Economic Forum work builds on what they did. And what they said at that time, this is four years ago, mankind should take a serious approach towards the formation of a de desired image of the future. One should not treat the future as a simple continuation of the present, as if tomorrow does not differ from the previous day. And they talked of six trends, which are very relevant in today's uh, context. Digitization of all areas of life. And you know, the COVID crisis has accelerated digitization faster than any CEO or CTO would have done. I think the COVID information officer actually ensured that digitization goes in much faster than anything than that. The second was automation and robotization and intelligent automation. The demographic challenges, Europe, Japan, other countries are aging, India, yeah. Africa, young populations. Formation of a network society. Fifth, globalization, economic, technological, and cultural, despite the current trend for localization, there is a lot of globalization, and globalization of the mind because of social uh, media and others. And then environmentalization, one distinct thing from the future in the future and the past, for example, for a country and developing country and for countries like India, while the developed world and the recently developed countries actually grew up and scaled in an era where there was no focus on climate, what we as a country need to do is to uh, is have this whole climate and environmentalization challenge that there is. And the mega trend which I talked about is acceleration going forward. All the above changes are actually happening exponentially. And you know, Moore's law is more applicable to this now than the semiconductor industry. The whole system will have new workplaces, new regulators, and new consumers. I think as a, uh, what, so what is the response here and what is that we need to do in the survival curve? I think there are three distinct categories of people that we need to look at. 
The first, those are education and training in many of your institutions. The second, obviously those who are not in education and training. And the third, those who are currently employed. Many people have said that there are fourth and fifth category. I believe that these are the three categories. There may be subcategories. For example, in education, you might have those in school, those are in colleges, those are in vocational training programs, those are in short-term programs, long-term programs. You might have researchers, people who are doing their PhDs, et cetera. And similarly, those who are out of education and, and training or a job may have had no formal education, had no training or no jobs, or may have had some education and no job, or had some education and some job. And if you look at the other category, uh, they're employed in jobs that are not will not change. And you go back to the earlier World Economic uh, Forum prediction that 65% of the jobs will no, do not exist currently. There are they employed in a job that would change or employed in a job that will vanish. In my view, uh, in this category, there's no fourth category. So whatever we do as a, as a civilization has to really focus on these uh, aspects uh, going forward. Now, if you look at it, as a global community, we really have different players in the ecosystem. The first is, you know, the governments, right? So what could governments do? What could education and training institutions do? What could the labor workforce do? Fourth, the students, fifth as a community, and sixth as employers, because this is about business and technology. I think governments have to create the current policies and programs and look at collaboration. They have to look at skill funds. 100 plus countries around the world have established skill, skill funds. 50 plus are looking at future skills. And you actually look at a whole new skilling and education strategy going forward. Education training providers need to look at partnerships, ability to change, adapt. The education context of academic councils, changing the curriculum in an established educational system in most developing countries is a whole long process. You have to go through the Senate, the academic council, the, you know, the department. It's a real thing. And we have to really, it's not keeping in pace with the need to change. The labor unions have to actually participate, proact be proactive and promote reskilling and upskilling. And the students have to learn to learn and learn to adapt. As a community, we need to respect skills. Do not Distinguish between vocational education, reward and respect people for their ability. I think employers have to be participative, signaling to the universities and teaching institutions what are the skills required, what are the competencies required, looked at skill based hiring, looking at standard setting, promote partnerships and apprenticeships, and provide career pathways. I think this is important from the context of what uh, we are looking at. But if you look at all these players and in the skilling cycle, there are literally actually three areas of skilling. The first to either category of people is teaching a new skill, something which they don't know. The second is upskilling a person. And the third is reskilling a person uh, going forward. And each of the seven Participants, as I said, have a role to play when you go forward. So if I look at what needs to be done, let's say for education institutions. So the work that was done very interestingly, you looked at the new emerging jobs that are there. You mapped the education institutions on which are the education institutions that could develop undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral research programs in those particular competencies or skills that are required. And you actually help and found out who could collaborate to develop the curriculum. Then you identified the gaps, you looked at the curriculum, you looked at the faculty training needs of the institution, and you said if faculty is not available locally, where can we get faculty in India when artificial intelligence and machine learning was being introduced? Many of the private institutions actually got faculty from Russia because they were the farthest, uh, you know, the farthest down the curve uh, there. And you build a plan for the whole ecosystem. 
on how the new courses need to uh, introduce, which are the curriculums need to update, where are the faculty who you need to get, and also plan the timetable in such a way that the faculty are available across institutions, including travel time. And despite the tube strike, for example, in the UK, you actually get that uh, going. So, you know, if you were to take an example, and you, if you remember that I started off by saying that expansion of medicine and, uh, you know, expansion of the curriculum, how do you address that? So expansion of medicine and healthcare, there are increasing pe uh, pressure on times for curriculum. Now, for the healthcare curriculum in general and the specialty, the response should be to initially focus on those learning outcomes specifically required for clinical learning needs or relevant research context should be included in the context of the immediate needs for employability and first cycle graduates. That's an example from the medical uh, field that we're looking at. So each one uh, has to look at a kind of a system in which we address the global uh, challenge. I think if I were to talk of what we need to do going forward, and this is a very interesting concept, I think we need to focus on the institutions, on new skilling, upskilling, and reskilling, and look at a SEER's approach. SEER is a teacher, but you look at that, setting standards in the economic context, in the employment context, and the relevance currently and in the future, and the relevance to society. And I would like to end by quoting from Amritya Sen, that human development as an approach is concerned with what I take to be basic development idea, namely advancing the richness of human life rather than the richness of the economy in which human beings live, which is only a part of it. And I think if as organizations, we don't do it, just to uh, talk of General Shin Senki, who was the former chief of staff and the former secretary of veteran affairs of the US, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And I'm open to questions. Uh, uh, and uh, we are really, really privileged uh, to have you uh, as our uh, keynote speaker in the opening session. Sorry that I, London is still waking up, and I'm sure that you know, uh, there are some questions where skiing is probably the, the most important issue today. Uh, and uh, uh, and this is why it is important because this is linked to our uh, existential crisis. You know, either we, we skill ourselves or we perish. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, the the uh, the rate of the of the the rate of obsolescence of the technology. Uh, you skill today, we don't know whether well, we exist tomorrow with that skill or not. Uh, and I was looking at the list of some of these uh, skills which are really uh, going out. Even the accounting, for instance, uh, even most of the physicians, even who are doing the job today. They probably want to be there because uh, AI, artificial intelligence, will take over, and we are getting our medical recipe from them. So, so how do the humanity would uh, deal with this uh, obsolescence? Uh, whatever we know, whatever we plan today, as you rightly say, US, look at this. Whatever they play, plan, that's no more. So, how do you deal with this obsolescence? And I think before the conference, also we had a very brief chat on the phone, and I said uh, I was uh, reading this Yuval Harari and uh, looking uh, at his uh, what he calls it. It's a very pejorative term. I, I do not agree with him calling it a useless class. Now, what is it's a useless class? You see, he probably meant it in his own way uh, uh, that uh, by 2050 a large part of the humanity would not have any job, nothing to do. How do they survive? And somehow we may also losing the concept of a welfare state. And, uh, and no matter how you plan it, a welfare state cannot afford to feed 50, 70% of the population. This is what happening in, uh, in many countries. Uh, so you need young, vibrant, 
energetic workforce who can contribute to this process of asset building. So what do you say about this? So, you know, there is this constant debate. You know, if I go back in the history, when the printing press was introduced, you know, a lot of, you know, people thought that uh, manuscripts will uh, disappear, you know. I think, uh, you know, more manuscripts are being produced today than were produced when the uh, when the printing press, uh, press was uh, invented. Second, when the factories uh, came in, you know, there was automation, you know, uh, right, the steam engine, et cetera, and the second industrial uh, revolution, people talk that, you know, the jobs will decline, jobs went up. If you look at computers in the banking industry, felt that uh, the, the, the bank the, the banks would actually uh, employees and number reduce, but the converse happened. If it fintech, we thought the same thing is happening. So I think uh, it's a it's a it's a, uh, the jobs change, the nature of jobs change. Uh, okay, going forward, uh, you know, if if for example. If the you know your physician that you talked about, right, uh, it will repeat be replaced by artificial intelligence. No, there will be new diseases. There'll be research on new diseases. A lot of areas like Kala Azar and you know and let's say uh, malaria and uh, diseases typical of Africa and the developing world. Currently, researchers and people don't have time to do that because they're focusing on cancer and you know other things. So what will happen is that new jobs will be created in new areas of relevance to mankind. And, and humankind, and more of the issues be solved. You know, you will have a pressure on agriculture, right? Because the number of mouths to feed will be possibly more. So how do you improve productivity? How do you get synthetic food, right? We are already seeing mm -hmm. synthetic proteins and animal, uh, you know, uh, non-animal uh, using uh, proteins to prepare something, you know, which is vegan and all of that. So there will be a lot of new areas that will come in. And therefore, in the context that I mentioned, you will have to reskill a lot of population. You have to upskill a lot of population to give new skills. New skills is not only giving skills to a person who's not skilled, but new skills would be giving. For example, when I took the healthcare example, right? Uh, you know, earlier you used to train nurse nurses. Today you have a pediatrician nurse. You have an intensive care nurse. You have a disability nurse. Going forward, as the population ages, there'll be a huge number of elderly care people. The current medical system does not have psychologist, uh, physiologist, physiotherapist, interventionist to treat the disorders that will have in the in the in the elderly. So there is going to be a huge opportunity that the rate and pace of change will there. And of course, then people will turn to leisure as a career. So in a lockdown, for example, the number of chefs, the number of dancing instructors, yoga instructors, musicians, you take, you know, we just had a huge creative economy blossoming in the last three years. So, uh, so still, uh, leave it a very basic question is that uh, the how still we deal with the fast obsolescence. So one way you suggested is that we're creating, uh, we start investing more time in researching and identifying new needs or even combating the existing needs. Uh, look at uh, an epidemic like COVID, which completely upended the world. And uh, uh, so we need some kind of a very disruptive uh, technology, which can do a kind of a genomic surveillance to keep eye on about 250, I was reading the list of these uh, World Health Organizations, about 250 uh, new viruses that we, which are threatening to enter into our lives. So you think that kind of thing, spending more time in research uh, and, uh, and which is uh, not about uh, skill, uh, killing, skilling somehow has to be integrated with research, I guess. No, so so let me let me take the COVID example. And I think one thing that as a global community and nations need to actually learn and take forward from the COVID is the new rapid response and the new forms of collaboration and cooperation, whether it's private sector, government, government, state, citizen, everybody, that evolved during this period of time. For example, in India, we had no PPE kits, no masks, no ventilators there. Government and industry got together and in rapidly uh, started uh, producing masks at village level enterprises and PPE kits. And then we started exporting to the world. 
now the challenge is we have created that manufacturing capability that, that there's no need you know as the as the uh, pandemic wanes for so many masks and ppe kits what do they pivot into can we use the same example to identify what they do and to actually supply school uniforms for developing countries uh, other aspects for countries where it is required using the same skills so that is one second is for the obsolescence issue and the increasing in skills you have to have a rapidly changing so again in the covid thing one shortage was of healthcare workers and general duty assistants so you went on to online programs before covid online programs were looked down on one they said no your skilling has to be physical now everything went online and now of course you're going back to the real world not realizing that if you the blend the online and real world you can actually create a much more impact going forward so i think the lessons of the pandemic have been taken into the future we have to look at creating public private partnerships and international partnerships so example oxygen shortage in in india we got containers from the uae british oxygen and uk supplied oxygen someone in in singapore supplied something else we had uh, zeolite coming in from different parts of the world so that kind of an ecosystem and cooperative ecosystem is required to address the challenges of the future thank you so much dilip and uh, i am sure that you know that uh, not from uh, the audience would like to ask question to dilip because this is a subject which is so close to our heart and which is directly linked to our own existence uh, so uh, uh, i'm sure that dr uh, i see dr rajat baisha also he is uh, eager with the questions uh, dr baisha i'm sure that we always discuss about skill and i'm sure that you know you meet your friend uh, dilip now online uh dr baisha we can't hear you you have to unmute yourself uh -huh. sir unfortunately unfortunately i had some technical difficulty possibly you can also see my name is not appearing my system's name is appearing there i was not able to hear um, um uh, dr dilip sinoy's um, uh, no speech for for quite some time i could hear only the end and and slide and the 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 questions that you have raised so it will not be appropriate for me to raise a question so primarily the, yeah. largely the, the discourse was about uh, the the how how we skill ourselves what is the kind of a predictive analysis that you do about skilling because the obsolescence the rate of obsolescence is so high and uh, dilip was quoting quite a few models uh, so how do you deal with this obsolescence technology obsolescence which is uh, keeping just, a lot of just to, just to egg on the professor you know uh, you know yeah. uh, yeah. professor atreya mb atreya right and you professor well. yeah, you're yeah, professor your management your your management so one thing how to treat obsolescence and in particular response to mbas was to say that every mba degree or mba certificate has end of life so that means if you've done an mba uh, and the end of life is 3 years you got to go and upskill or reskill yourself to continue to be qualified as an mba you know that is one one thought that he had and does it it applies to physicians you know it applies to welders but somehow it does not apply to engineers or you know other people like that so i mean, that's an interesting concept but i personally you no know, think being an uh... a uh, tan coat academician because i spent long years in industry in corporate world and then came to academics uh, i i feel that the what we teach in management schools uh, particularly in india uh, is not uh, up to the requirement even if we compare uh with the current need of the industry uh if we have to the way the things are changing the way business models are changing because of uh technology change and particularly under industry 4.0 environment uh the the the, the curriculum need to change and curriculum need to be very very flexible and uh, the lot of freedom should be given to the faculty uh including the the external or visiting faculty which who are normally involved in delivering any program so that they can include 
uh, the the courses or the contents that are more relevant in the current um, uh, situation and the current environment. Uh, those flexibilities are not there in most of the institutions. Fortunately, in IITs, uh, we are flexible from long time. And therefore, uh, the external or visiting faculty, uh, as well as the internal faculty, who are the course coordinators, they are not limited by the course designed and uh, uh, already already uh, there in the curriculum, which is which is announced. You see. The dictum is what you will have to cover. Minimum what is already there that has to be there. In addition, you can cover anything you like to ensure that the engineers graduating or the management students graduating are relevant to the extent possible. And the questions are also designed, uh, which is also flexible. It is not necessary that you will have to ask questions uh, in or set papers, examination papers from the, the original, um, uh, the declared scheduled curriculum. Because the curriculum design in, in our system, and particularly in IITs, I have seen, it takes years. There is a very rigorous process. So as far as this particular question question is concerned, I we think that we produce PhDs just to make them uh, understand how the research is done. done. So we don't create or produce PhDs who have done significant amount of work and did something uh, new to grant them PhDs, which was the theories earlier we used to. When we graduated and we became PhDs, that was the necessary thing. And we were uh, you know, given permission to submit thesis once we qualify for that, that criteria, which is no longer the case. You see. So similarly, the, my observation is, is that uh, the the students we teach, they have to be trained and retrained, and this is a big task for the for the industry. We work, and I still work uh, with industries in in India and abroad. Uh, the task of training and retraining is a huge um, uh, responsibility for the industry, and the organizations are designed, resources are are uh, allocated to train them. Uh, in the areas uh, to make them uh, effective and efficient uh, so that the business can perform better. Thank you. Thank you, Dilip. And uh, any other questions from the floor? Uh, 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 do you have any question you want to take skill to our afternoon conference today, morning conference in London today? Definitely ask this pointed question to everyone because this is something that is so essential. Uh, uh, any Anyone else? Or uh, uh, then we have to listen to, request to listen to Dilip again. Uh, he's such an interesting speaker. And uh, uh, and then it's such, an, it's such a riveting uh, topic. Uh, Dilip, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and, Coming at such a short notice, I really, really appreciate on behalf of uh, the organizers of the conference and all the audience, I uh, uh, give you a round of applause. And uh, we certainly look forward to see you again. And I'm sure that, you know, you would, uh, if you find a little time to sit through uh, uh, Dr. Rajat Baj, uh, because no one has ha asked him very hard questions. I cannot because uh, he always sought me down. So I'm sure that you step back and ask him some very, very hard questions. <laughs> so thank you. Thank so you. I'll just go on. I'll go on incognito mode and thank you for the opportunity, but I'll be listening in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Asraful, uh, uh, we now, uh, thank you so much uh, 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 to our Delhi Sanoi and to those who have joined late. Uh, you just listened to Delhi Sanoi, who was uh, the... Uh, CEO of CEO and managing director of the National Skill Development Commission of India, uh, and he also was the secretary general uh, of FIKI, uh, one of the largest associate industry association in the planet. 
this is called this stands for Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, so we will have the opportunity to uh, hear uh, Dilip Sanna again, uh, and I will certainly look forward to all your feedback uh, 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 to this uh, keynote so that this can be passed on to uh, Mr. Dilip Sanna. Thank you, Dilip.